fantastic. Thank you very much indeed for uh, inviting me here. Can everybody hear me? Uh, and what I'm going to talk about today is an area in northeast Wales, um, titled it Multitude of Designations, and I'll explain why in a minute by a series of about half a dozen maps with lots of different lines on them. Um, I'm based in a county called Denbyshire in North East Wales, a small area, about 90,000 hectares, about 90,000 people, half of which live in a very small part of that along the coast. I work within a countryside service as the only archaeologist in the area, although obviously the, in Wales we have the archaeological trust and there is a trust that covers the area in which I work. But as a, an archaeologist within a local authority, I'm quite a rare phenomenon in Wales. Um, and because of that, I've, I've, I've been there quite a long while as well, which has its advantages and disadvantages, but it does mean you get to know people well. And in the 20 years that I have been there, I've spent a lot of time shoving foots in doors to keep those doors open, to open up um, communication, develop trust with people so that things do happen. Um, and what I'm going to do this morning is to try and show by a series of sort of practical projects that I've been able to develop in the area, how in an area where there's not that many people, there's not a lot of money, um, but we can actually make quite a big difference to the historic environment. So the area, you can see on the map Chester there, it's just into Wales in the north. Um, the big green blob on that is an AOMB, Area of Outstanding Natural Beauty, Category 5 landscape in the same way as national parks are Category 5 landscapes. This particular one was extended uh, six years ago and the southern area is now included. It was just the northern area. There's a World Heritage Site, that's the purple bit at the bottom, um, and that is a very narrow actual World Heritage Site, a canal, but also with a buffer zone around it. That was inscribed 2009. There's a national trail. Uh, there are country parks. Then also on top of that, we've got special areas of conservation, which are national natural environment designations um, that are EU level. They're the blue. Sites of special scientific interest are UK-wide designations. They're the red, but all those blue areas are underpinned by sites of special scientific interest. And those in this particular area, particularly in the south, it's largely heather moorland, blanket bog, that sort of landscape, but there's also limestone grassland, things of that sort. Um, and so that's being the, the people who are particularly interested in that. It's the natural environment they're keen on protecting. We've also got lots of scheduled monuments. They're the less easy to see on this map because often they're quite small areas but they're the um, pinky purple so the long lines to the right of the map are Offer and Watts Dyke. You'll notice that Offer's Dyke is nowhere near Offer's Dyke National Trail in this area. Um, we've also got historic parks and gardens, they're the, the green. Then we get historic landscapes as well. Throughout Wales, there has been a piece of work, was well, about 20 years ago now, identifying historic landscapes. They're a non-statutory designation, but taken into consideration within the planning system in the same way as historic parks and gardens are. Then, and this is an old map, there's, there's all the undesignated archaeology, which is now available through Archwilio, which is a Wales-wide online resource and the front face of the historic environment record is available for anyone who wants. Um, it's available online and in Wales since um, the Act, the Historic Environment Act of 2016, it's a statutory duty. It was going to be a statutory duty on local authorities but it is a statutory duty on Welsh Government in the actual Act. So that that is a real coup for Wales. So that's, that's all of that, apart from the undesignated um, archaeology there. It's very complicated, and there's lots of competing interests of people coming from very different perspectives looking at the same piece of land. On top of that, got lots of visitors. Um, this, the, the picture here is the highest point in one of those country <coughs> parks, um, 
the little stub of masonry in the middle is called the Jubilee Tower, and this photograph was taken at its 200th birthday party, when 5,000 people somehow found their way to the top of this hill. It's attracted people away at, at its opening 203 years ago. It attracted about 3,000 people, so it has attracted people for a long time. The area that we're talking about is very close to Merseyside, and there's a a long history of people coming from Liverpool, from Merseyside, into this area. In the past, it's been described as the lungs of Liverpool. So lots of people are coming, 250,000 to this particular country park and to another. There's an area called Horseshoe Pass in the south that equally attracts similar numbers of people, all having an impact. So we've got all these different designations, all these people. It'd be very easy for us just to all be in our various different corners, sort of saying, well, my designation's more important than yours. No, mine's an EU designation. No, mine's a UNESCO designation. And just sort of squabble. And we're talking about limited finances, limited funding. And if we do that, everyone's going after the same money and not actually going to be able to achieve very much. So... From my perspective, I've always felt that the best way to approach it is to work together. Not, not capitulating to other people's interests, but to work together and to try to achieve the outcomes that I want, but jointly with other people. And in a way, that's been a, a, an advantage for me. I mean, it would be easier to give up and just concentrate on the planning stuff, the, the sites that are in my direct control is sites we own, things of that sort. And it can appear that some, particularly the EU natural environment legislation could appear to trump everything else and you could just think, oh, it's just easy, I'll, I'll give up. I won't try and make a big difference. But I think it is possible. And in a way, I think I've been lucky in that the environment I've come from, we don't have budgets, we don't have money to spend. So if you want to do anything, you have to go out to other organisations, whether that be CADU in Wales uh, context, or the Lottery Fund, or other funds. That what they, I think it's just about to come to an end, but the um, REN funding for landfill tax, things of that sort. So going out to these other funders alongside colleagues who are working in other areas and developing joint projects. So that's what I thought I'd talk about, some of the joint projects that I have been able to become involved in to develop um, and look at some of the advantages of those and how we've got over some of those hurdles. Um, the first major project <coughs> that um, I was involved with was um, a Heritage Lottery Landscape Partnership Scheme. Those are lottery projects designed to look at quite large landscapes not just publicly owned, but public and privately owned. And the idea is that they bring together all interests in the landscape, so the historic environment, the natural environment, a lot of people engagement, community involvement. Uh, and the first one of these that I was involved in developing, we called it Heather and Hill Forts. It was quite easy. There's six hill forts, all but one in a heather landscape. The heather uh, some of it special area of conservation, EU designation, some of it not, but it was a handy, catchy title. Um, and it allowed us to do an enormous amount of work. It focused on two distinct areas, um, one the Fluidian Range um, hills and the other Clanticillia Mountain hills, both of which are now within the area of outstanding natural beauty. When this project started, only the northern, the Cluidian hills, were within the AOMB. And the project, as I said, it's, it's about more than the historic environment. Uh, a lot of the work on the natural environment involved setting fire to it, training um, farmers who had not um, done traditional management of heather for a generation, bringing back traditional management for agriculture, but also for um, birds, black grouse. If I, if I weren't here, I'd have been up at 3.30 this morning going to count those um, be so you saved me from an early start this morning. But so, so, so there was a lot of natural environment work, a lot of interpretation as well, standard stuff, pictures, boards, leaflets, um, but also um, more bearing in mind we were developing this 
We started in 2008, and it was a five-year project. Um, to have something that you could access on a mobile phone, not a smartphone, was quite novel at that stage. Things move on, things change. Um, but a lot of um, community engagement, developing a local group, um, lots of walks, talks, activities. But with the Hillfort side of things, the school activities, lots of school activities, taking youngsters, uh, this was taking them back in time from a car park where they met the archaeologist, top left, uh, past the gamekeeper, past the medieval knight. Sadly, the English knight is dead on the floor, sorry. Um, and then up to the hillfort. But also allowed us to do practical work, management work on these six hillforts. This particular one is called Penaclodii. Um, the line going straight through the middle is the Offa's Dyke National Trail. And from one end of that hillfort to the other on that straight line is half a mile. So it's quite large. Um, it's grazed. Um, the, it is partially heather clad. The heather um, hadn't been managed for many years. The grass was overgrazed, so there were quite a lot of erosion scars on the ramparts. We started by doing condition surveys of all six of the hill forks um, and then went on to do topographical plans, detailed topographical plans, which didn't exist before. The ordnance survey plans were the best that we had. And from those, from the point of view of public engagement, we were able to develop some interpretive information from that uh, topographical plan. Of in a while talk about some follow-up work to this project because I think another advantage of these sort of schemes is they enable, they, they carry on after the life of the project. Um, in the particular area where I am now, the tourism people are talking about the hillforts being a, a special feature of the area and promoting them and helping us look after them. So that, I think, is an advantage. And this just gives a flavour of the area. Penaclothi I Hillport to the top, Molartha at the bottom there. So it gives a sense of the type of landscape that we are dealing with. We were able to do a lot of erosion control. Um, because the Office Dyke National Trail either goes through the middle of several of these hill forts or skirts around the side of them. There were quite large erosion scars from footpaths. The condition surveys that we had carried out on all six hill forts had, ident had scaled that. So we had maps with red lines for the really bad erosion, blue and green for the, the sliding scale. So that was, that was easy to take out all the red ones. That was our to-do list. Um, we had already developed some of these um, ramps they're, they're an oak frame with pitched stone inside. One previously had been built, built and it had posts into the ground. The contractor who we then used said, no, you can do it without anything in the ground. Absolutely nothing. It just sits. So we've called them floating ramps. Obviously, they aren't floating. But nothing has gone into the ground. Wherever it has been necessary is built up rather than dug in. And they are now... Well, some of them are nearly 10 years old, um, and they seem to work. People seem to stick to them. They're not walking on the heather either side. Photograph on the left there, out of shot, is a Black & Decker workbench, a generator, and power tools. They were made custom-made on site because, obviously, a, the slope of the rampart isn't a standard shape, so each piece of um, timber was cut and jointed on site and then the pitching carried out. Um, the pitching, the stone that was used for the pitching is the natural stone from the area. We were very lucky, found a farmer who had a great heap of the stone in his field, bought it, it's still some of it left in the field, so we've just used it as necessary. And that's, that seems to have worked, seems to have been very successful. And was a we attracted a lot of CADU grant to this work, both for the ramps actually on the, the Shedrick Monument, but also work that we were doing just outside. There were some unexpected um, different stories that came out of this work. We did a little bit of excavation within the project. The Lottery Fund are not keen on research, so we didn't do any of that. Um, but we did do a little bit of excavation that linked into um, finding out 
why certain places were being eroded, whether there was um, archaeology there that needed protecting. Um, one particular hill fort, the, the scrambling bike activities, I'll show you that in a moment. But on this particular one, this was Penacloddyi Hill Fort, the northernmost end of it, small little barrow, Walker's Cairn on top, this stone turned up, it's got a name on it, Carlisle D. Chamberlain, Canadian Army. Google him, and he's, he was an American that signed up in World War I, press release, and his family in America get in touch, and that's him in World War II. So quite a lot of nice personal stories coming out, nothing to do with hill forts, particularly in, that, in the strictest sense, but a great way of engaging people with that place. And following on from this project, I think because it raised awareness about these sites in the area, um, we've had several excavations, research excavations carried out on them. This is um, Liverpool University Field School um, excavating at Penaclodiae, a section through the ramparts and an area of a house platform. This coming year is the final year. Um, we think that well, they, that's their plan. And so that came after the lottery project, no lottery money into it. And also at a nearby hill fort called Morligaya, um, Oxford University, or Gar Gary Locke, who's an emeritus professor at Oxford University, um, coming to excavate here um, with his team of volunteers from the Oxford area, but also a lot of local volunteers helping and getting involved. That is ongoing. His, this was two years ago, section through the rampart. He is coming again this year to start phase two, which I think is planned to be about five years, um, looking at an area of possible um, original gateway into the hillport. So we, we are getting research out of these sites as well as improvements, management, and as well as community engagement. I mentioned motorbike scrambling. Um, the, Funny shape just in the bottom right corner is not an archaeological site, it's a, an unofficial motorbike scrambling track. The hill fort is just to the left of it. Um, and in this instance, that, the moorland here is a special area of conservation site of special scientific interest. Um, it's not only motorbikes that have been up there, it's 4 by 4s it's all sorts of uh, vehicles. Um, it is um, open access land now, but that's an, a permissive footpath, it's not a right of way. Um, and we were able to engage the police in work jointly with CADU and with what was Countryside Council for Wales to have operations to try <coughs> to um, prevent the activity, to actually have some prosecutions of the people who are illegally damaging the SAC in this uh, instance, um, but also um, then doing some repair work. So a lot of practical work has taken place. And I think we were quite parsimonious with the money. We treated it very much like our own, um, and so we're very careful about how we spent it. Um, and we had money left. It was initially a three-year project, extended to five years. We still had a bit of money left, and we were able to do some conservation work on the Jubilee Tower, not at the best time of year, when you end up with bits of money um, that you need to spend, this had to be spent by September, I think, planning this sort of work. We started it actually in March, but it was the year that um, a great dump of snow came down at the end of March. So a county conservation officer up there in the freezing cold. But the end result has opened up a part of this feature, which attracts a quarter million people a year. Um, every New Year, unofficial firework displays and all sorts up there. Open up a part of it to interpret it as well and put up some in information, interpretation up there. Lots of events during the project, after the project. Um, Fireworks are its birthday party. The Jubilee Tower was chosen, not by ourselves, but as a, a, a anchor beacon, I think they called it, for the Queen's Jubilee celebrations. And we did an activity which we called Hillfort Glow, signalling between 10 Hillforts, some in Cheshire, some in North Wales at night, with, with members of the public up there. And I still get people coming along saying, oh, that was a wonderful evening. And we, were, we were just flicking torches on and off. But you're on top of a hill in the dark with a bit of cake and a bit of hot chocolate. And it was a fantastic feeling when you made that connection. We 
weren't slow in putting ourselves forward for prizes. Um, we won a Europa Nostra Award, took a local county councillor to meet the Queen of Spain. That went down very well. Um, yeah, we're, we're shameless, I guess, but you know, it, it all helped. Um, and still doing it. So the radio programme the other um, month was involved. And we're now developing a further landscape partnership scheme in the D Valley area, southern part of um, the AOMB and the county I work in called Our Picturesque Landscape. Uh, we're in the stage one part uh, development of it, about to submit stage two. This is where the World Heritage Site is, from sort of aqueduct here, um, but the World Heritage Site is 11 miles long and part of that. The archaeological side is a lot of industrial sites, which obviously this is, but it's also about opening up the views, because you can see how the site has been over, the time, <laughs> over time hidden. And it's an area um, where people, it's attracted travellers for several hundred years. I and mean, Turner's was there, Richard Wilson, the uh, landscape painter, um, Wordsworth, all, all sorts of um, worthies visited the area and the A5 follows through. So we're sort of building on that feeling of travelling through the area and various um, aspirations for the project. Again, marrying the historic environment and the natural environment. And this, again, some of the features within it. That's the beginning of the World Heritage Site. As well as bigger projects, I've been able to develop smaller, well, not, sm not sm over, the, over the years, they've been just as um, expensive, if you like, but more site-specific. So this is a castle called Castatinas Bran, um, bought for a pound in about 1990, sounds a snip, but £700,000 has been spent on it since to make sure it stays looking exactly the same. And the final phase of work was carried out with a Wren uh, landfill tax um, project uh, two years ago. Prior to that, it was CADU, CADU money and um, the local county council, but the local county council, my employer, pulled the plug about eight years ago before we completed the work. This site, scheduled monument, site of special scientific interest, so it's marrying those different um, interests and it's making sure you get the necessary consents. And by developing trust with the officers in Countryside Council of Wales, Natural Resources Wales, CADU, these things people know we're going to deliver, so promote them and support us. A Neolithic care, well, we think it's Neolithic care, can't prove it, um, in the north of the county was getting very overgrown with vegetation, uh, managed to get some funding from, in this case, CADU. This also, Scheduled Monument, Site of Special Scientific Interest, CADU provide the money to clear it. Natural Resources Wales provide the land, the agreement with the landowner to maintain that clearance. And now there's some money from Welsh Government directly, from an access fund, that we can produce some information um, and improve the access to it. Um, Another individual site, a Cornish engine house, lead mining, was falling down. As you can see, on, it's actually, it wasn't in bad condition, but the roof was uh, suffering and that water beginning to get into it, lintels beginning to go. Schedule monument, listed building. Uh, survey work done with Welsh Development Agency derelict land grant in the early 2000s, but no money to follow up and do the repair work until um, three years ago when, again, a Wren landfill tax pot of money. So now, rather than the roof looking like this or that, beams <laughs> replaced, roof completely refurbished, um, and structure in a much better condition. This roof, though, was the cause of great consternation between the Bat fraternity and myself and Cadu uh, from the historic environment. In between all of those timbers, you've got plaster work. It should cover the whole of the slate. Um, it's called torching, and it should be. Traditionally, it would cover the whole of the slate. The Bat fraternity wanted felt up there. That's much better if you're a bat. You can cling on to it, apparently. Uh, and we had to compromise in this instance. And that's the only time things have got slightly 
tents in all of these projects and everything else, we've been able to work together um, and to develop projects together and achieve joint aims. And even then, we, we, we managed it, but it was, it was a free song of excitement that we might not quite make it. So I just listed down here a few of the things that I feel has helped enable these projects to happen from the basis of nothing, really, but working with partners, which I'm forced to do because we, I need to, and achieving joint objectives, working with my colleagues internally, but also externally, communities, local groups, academics, all of those types of groups, but also being very aware of my interests, keeping control of that. Perhaps I'm a control freak, but I want to keep that where I know what's happening and I know that the results are good and what I want. And that promise and follow-up is quite important. I think that's how I've developed trust over the 20 years. If you say you're going to do something, whether it's to the planners, the highways, or a member of the public, do it. And then when you want help from them, they will support you. So I'll leave it there, and thank you very much indeed.